Design in architecture reached a zenith five centuries before the Christ had entered Athens, the centre of the ancient Greek world. Sparseness moulded the enterprise of its people, and it is the place where many believe that artists have never been more successfully caught between the meeting of the human and the divine. At the heart of ancient Greek philosophy regarding the natural environment was a conviction that when man made an architectural intervention, whether it be a temple, theatre, agora or a house in town, that he must respect what was regarded as the landscape of the gods. The Greeks believed a genius loci or guardian spirit existed within each part of the landscape and that reaching out and identifying the deity fundamental to each location was the duty of the builder. The spirit was then divined in a special ceremony to ensure that the architecture entered into a partnership with the land so that there was and would always remain harmony between man and nature. In ancient Greece, the polis, or city unit, was an ideal model for nurturing and fostering community life. Greek civic spaces were designed for exercise, study, and sacramental purposes. Its people lived a way of life intimately connected to their temples and shrines. Choosing the site for a Greek temple was a rational, explicit, and well-planned exercise. Its design involved people in an emotional process which had implications for society that today scholars are only now beginning to fully comprehend. A building was a mixture of both open and closed spaces, providing a contrast between light and shade. An element of mystery was reinforced when hidden views gradually revealed themselves along a calculated but often disguised journey through an architectural space. This suggested to the participator that patience and contemplation should be an integral aspect of their life's journey. The three architectural systems ancient Greeks used are named for the community of people who developed them. They are the Doric, Ionic and Corinthian orders and each had a distinct political purpose and celebrated Greek civic power and pride. They easily adapted from construction in timber to construction in stone. Built in 432, years before the Christ event on the high ground and security of the Acropolis at Athens, the Parthenon was constructed of pentelic marble. Today its subtle optical refinements are much admired. They include irregular spacing of its columns, which tilt inward while appearing to be straight to the naked eye. The mathematics is mind-boggling, and the sheer quality of the Parthenon's sculptural reliefs sets it apart from all the other temples of the ancient Greek world. They abound in political, civic and religious significance. The sculptor Phidias, assisted by some of Attica's finest emerging artistic talents, executed them. They survived the fury of Christian fundamentalists in the year 395, Muslim iconoclasm after the Turkish conquest of 1456, and Venetian cannon fire in 1687. Today they can be viewed in the Acropolis Museum nearby at Athens, the British Museum at London and La Louvre at Paris. A Greek house presented high blank walls to the street and consideration of the winds and the path of the sun were of primary importance to its layout. The side facing south was elevated to receive the winter sun as it dipped low in the sky and the side facing north was lowered to eliminate cold winds. It also made the lived-in parts of the house as comfortable as possible, with the cleansing winds ensuring that its occupants remained free of disease and pestilence. Such a house was a hallmark of the civilised Greek man. Its inner courtyards were a focus for family life and an important source of light for rooms arranged around them. Glass was not yet available, so windows were either non-existent or small and placed up high for airflow, but also to prevent drafts. 
In winter, they were covered with a screen of plaited rushes. The plan of a Greek house varied according to the size of the land, the size of the owner's family, and the size of his wealth. There was great diversity about the way its rooms were used. They were not set in their ways, but organised rooms to suit the changing needs of an ever-expanding and contracting household, which included its visitors. The Romans admired the Greeks and in their cities, trees framed temples, civic buildings and amphitheatres echoing the universal forms of Greek architecture. During the first century they improved on the Greek house and the Roman villa achieved a high point of sophistication and elegance in domestic architecture. Temples were raised on a podium and were given dignity, validity and authority. In the forum, colonnades of Travertine provided a seamless shaded journey from one building to another and the pavement featured Travertine flagstones bearing inscriptions in bronze letters. Through an amazing feat of engineering, sewerage and heating systems used water which was brought from the country to the city by aqueducts and then fed into its buildings through lead pipes. Gardens became integral to town planning, providing essential shade. They also contained fountains and statuary of mythological or political significance. Emperor Nero is recorded as proclaiming words to the effect, Ah, now at last I can live as a human being, when he gazed upon the many splendours of his newly built Dermisoria, or Golden House. The Golden House was, without doubt, a crazy short-lived architectural wonder. At its worst, it reflected the material excesses of its megalomaniac emperor owner. At its best, it showcased Rome's outstanding contribution to posterity, the invention of concrete, the wonder-building material of the ancient world. The recipe for concrete, like so much else, was lost when Rome was overrun in the 4th century by warring tribes from the north. Italian scholars rediscovered it and a great deal of other facts about ancient architecture during a 15th century search of monastery libraries. Today, the archaeological remains of both ancient Greece and Rome provide an insight into their cultural development at any given time in history. Their architecture is called classic because its quality in both craftsmanship and materials is of acknowledged excellence.